So thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Before we get started, just wanna check that everything is working. If you can hear me, uh, we just ask that you drop a note in the chat box. Let us know where you're joining us from. And if you're so inclined, we also invite you to let us know your favorite quote or song from Hamilton the play. Uh, we'd love to hear that. If you have any technical issues throughout tonight's broadcast, feel free to use the chat feature to let us know and we'll take care of that for you. Good evening, my name is Eric Carpio with History Colorado. I'm here with tonight's featured speaker, Roberto Montoya. Tonight's event is part of History Colorado's Borderlands of Southern Colorado online lecture series offered by our three Southern Colorado museums, El Pueblo History Museum, Fort Garland Museum and Cultural Center, and the Trinidad History Museum. Before we begin tonight's program in the spirit of healing and education, we acknowledge the 48 contemporary tribes with historic ties to the state of Colorado. These tribes are our partners. We consult with them when we plan exhibits, collect, preserve, and interpret artifacts, do archeological work, and create educational programs. We recognize these indigenous peoples as the original inhabitants of this land. As always, I'd like to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area and Colorado State University Pueblo for their continued support of the Borderlands of Southern Colorado lecture series. If you'd like to join our Borderlands project or join in support of our Borderlands project, we invite you uh, to support this initiative by contributing at coloradogives.org. As you know, all of our Borderlands series is offered on a donation basis only, so your support will allow us to continue and expand on events like tonight's. And I'll drop the link in the chat box um, later this evening. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's guest, Roberto Montoya. Roberto is the West Regional Manager with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. He's the host and creator of Theory Heads, a podcast that explores the intersection of hip hop and academic scholarship. And if I may quote Hamilton, Roberto is a hero and a scholar. Um, and in, in his own words, an overall history and government nerd. So Roberto, welcome brother. We're glad to have you tonight. Thank you so much, Eric. It's, it's such a pleasure to be here with you all. And I certainly wanna thank History Colorado, uh, the Borderlands Lecture Series, um, and, and my, my dear hermano, Eric Carpio, who is, is a fellow co-conspirator co from cohort six of the Latino Leadership Institute. And, and we roll deep in six. And so I'm so excited to be here to talk about you know, some of my favorite things, Hamilton, the play, history, government, society, identity. And so I'm just so extremely excited to be here with you. Again, my name is uh, Roberto Montoya. My preferred pronouns are he, him, el, ello. I uh, do work for the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, and I do host Theory Heads, the podcast. We've been on a bit of a hiatus as I'm trying desperately to finish my dissertation, but know that we have some interviews recorded and we'll be getting some out soon. But I do want to also note that, that my thoughts today are mine and do not represent the organizations that I work with and that I work for. Um, with that said, I do also, I'm coming to you from Commerce City, which is the stolen lands of, but not limited to um, the Arapaho, the Cheyenne and the Ute. And so I'm so, um, it's so important to acknowledge the place that I'm coming to you from. And in that vein, I think it's really important to set some, some guidelines for our conversation tonight, because we're gonna talk about the play, which I love dearly, but also we're gonna talk about you know, some other important issues that, that are not always easy to talk about. And so when I do these types of talks and when I engage in dialogue with folks, and I hope that we can through the, the, the question and answer, I wanna talk a little bit and set the framework for that. And I wanna lean on indigenous epistemologies to do that. And I come out of ethnic studies and in particular Chicano studies. And we use um, this Mayan precept to kind of frame our dialogue and it's called in Lakesh. And I'm gonna share it with you and I'll read it with you. And essentially, and it comes from a poem called Pensamiento Serpentino by Luis Valdez. And it says this, Tu eres mi otro yo, you are my other me. Si de hago daño a ti, if I do harm to you, me hago daño a mi mismo, I do harm to myself. Si te amo y respeto, if I love and respect you, me amo y respeto yo, I love and respect myself. And so I share that with us today to know that I come from this, from a deep sense of humility and reciprocity and knowing that in this conversation, um, if I do harm you, I'm harming myself and that is not my intent at all. So I wanna welcome that or this conversation in that way and hopefully frame it that. So I appreciate you um, listening to that and, and, and us adhering to it. But with that said, 
Um, I, I, I mean, this is like a dream talk for me, I, I have to admit, talking about the utility and complexity of, of Hamilton the Musical because this, this musical has been a part of my life, probably a much bigger part of my life than, than it should be and, and that my partner would probably also agree. Um, and I think it's, it's just an, a unique opportunity to, to talk about it in this moment, to talk about its utility and its complexity, because I think we are in a moment right now where, at least in my entire life, that there was, a, there was a leaning in and an appetite to talk about race and equity in a way that I haven't experienced. But there's also the antithesis to that, which is the resistance and the reticence and, and quite frankly, the, the heinousness that also comes with these conversations. And so it's a unique opportunity. I'm very honored to be here to talk through this with you all. Uh, so let, let's talk a little bit about Hamilton. And I think in order to have this conversation, I have to, to tell you a little bit about my story with Hamilton and, and how it came to me. And I really have to, um, to acknowledge my good friend, Jeremy Lyle, who was the first person who ever told me about this play. And he saw Hamilton when it was off Broadway. And I'll never forget the conversation. I was driving, I think, to pick up one of my young sons from daycare. And he called me, which was odd because Jeremy usually texts me, text, sends me text messages. And he says, hey, I just saw a play that's right up your alley. And, and, I, said, and I was like, you know, what, what is it? He's like, well, it's a play about American history, but it uses hip hop and it has all these actors of color. And I think you'd be really interested. And I didn't know how to even take the call. And, and so I'm like, oh, okay, that sounds cool. Um, and I kind of just put it aside. Then it, Hamilton makes its way on to Broadway at the Rogers Theater. My friend Jeremy, again, goes to see the play. Uh, calls me again and says, hey, you really have to come to, to New York to see this play. At the time, I, I was, you know, uh, just teach, I was teaching and not making a lot of money. So the idea of going to New York to see a play was so, was so outside of my financial reality. So I, again, I'm just like placating him saying, yeah, yeah, it sounds really cool. Um, about a month later, the cast soundtrack drops. And again, he and I are Spotify friends. He sends me the link. I finally get a chance to listen to the play. And like many folks who, who, who get a chance to dig into the, the soundtrack, I was hooked immediately for a variety of different reasons was one, I'd never heard anything like this. I, I was kind of, you know, plays were never really, really my thing, especially musicals, um, but this was something different. And in, in my first subsequent listening uh, to the play, I realized that Jeremy was right, that this was right up my alley, because similar to, you know, Lin-Manuel will talk about this in terms of when he first read about Hamilton, that he read that he thought it was hip hop, right? This was someone who wrote his way you know, out of poverty, who had beef with everybody, but through his written word was able to kind of elevate himself, which to me as a writer, as a historian, um, and as a lover of hip hop, there was, a, there was an intersection and a collision of so many things that meant so much to me in my, in my life. And this play came to me at a time when I was really immersed in coursework in my PhD. So it was, it was a perfect storm, if you will. And so I just, just threw myself into this play, grabbed Ron Chernow's book, which the play is based on, which is the biography of, of Alexander Hamilton, and just really started engaging and interrogating not only the play, but the history. And I should say that I'm a, a political science undergrad, so this, this is not new to me, but it was new to me, like so many folks. And so that's when I started thinking of the play beyond just the dopeness of it, from a hip hop standpoint, but there was great utility as I started really immersing myself in it within the characters, within so many of the deliveries of information. And I, I started thinking at the time I was teaching social foundations of, of diversity in education. And so I started thinking because the play was such, um, such an interesting dynamic and juxtapositions of so many things, I started thinking about how can I use this play with my pre-service teacher candidates to begin to think about certain things. But in order to, to really do that, and what's really cool is when you're teaching at the college level, you can kind of, you know, you're writing your syllabus, you get a syllabus, but you have some flexibility in terms of what each of those classes look like. And I remember just making my classes listen to the play. And I'm sure that for many of my students were like, what, we're just listening to a play today? How awesome is that? 
But I was doing that because I really wanted to, to, to get them thinking about not only the play, but also thinking about what are the pedagogical tools that are kind of influenced within this play. And for me, I thought the first place to start was we, we have to talk about the hip hop in the play because it's, it's just, that is one of the things that, that when you engage and when you listen to the play is one of the first things that hit you. And I appreciate Eric sharing the song earlier, if you logged on a little earlier, because you get to hear it and you get to get a sense of, of just, of, of the sonic aspects of this play. And so I think it's important for us to, let's, let's talk a little bit about the hip hop in the play, because I think that frames up a lot of the rest of the conversation. Because Lin-Manuel uses hip hop you know, in, in, in such an effective and clever way throughout this play, that for me as a hip hop head, it, 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 it just, that was one of the hooks for me, one of the main hooks, not just the history. So, you know, and in, in the play, there are so many references to, to different hip hop songs from Melly Mel and the Furious Five to Mob Deep's Shook Ones to, you know, the, the kind of more obvious ones, which is like the Notorious B.I.G., you know, and I'll never forget the first time I heard 10 Dual Commandments. And I actually just rewatched the play recently this, this weekend with my good friend, Marco Antonio. And as soon as the play ended, we had to listen to Biggie's 10 Crack Commandments because using that within the play to tell a story about dueling is just genius. And so in, in using it, and, and to me, for, for us, and when I was talking to my teacher candidates, is one of the things that we, w that we talk about in teaching is how are you culturally responsive to your, to your students? And, you know, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, hip hop's birthday was, was recent, you know, it's in 1973. So I'm a little bit younger than, than hip hop, but I grew up with hip hop. It, it, it essentially is a part of my epistemology. It is inextricably a part of the way that I have come to know the world because I grew up with it. And so this play and these, these references um, were not just speaking to me from, from a lover of the culture and of the music, but it was speaking to my ways of knowing and giving me access to information by anchoring it and being responsive to those ways of knowing. And so it was really a unique way to do that. And I was trying to articulate this to some of my teachers um, and future teacher candidates. But what's, what's interesting is beyond just the, the homage and, and the references to songs, Lin-Manuel was also able to use lyricism within the play to differentiate the characters. So let, let me give you a good example. In, in, in Aaron Burr, one of the songs that starts, it, it, you know, it starts with this kind of really basic, I'm John Lawrence in the place to be. Three pence, uh, three, two pints of Sam Adams, but I'm working on three. So you hear that rhyme, which is a kind of a really basic type of rhyme scheme, A, A, B, B. And you can see that John Lawrence is kind of, you know, this, this really early on rapper. Think of some of the early rappers, Curtis Blow, other folks who didn't have really intricate rhyme schemes. And so even um, um, Lafayette's rhymes are, are, are pretty are along the same lines that are, that are of this kind of basic pattern. But then when you get to my shot, you get Alexander Hamilton coming in and you know, his rhyme schemes are completely different, which I think Lin-Manuel is using it as a way to show Hamilton's kind of elevated thinking in addition to, in the way that he was thinking about the revolution, the way that he was thinking about this new nation, and, it, and he, so he uses even the rhyme schemes to differentiate between that. Because in Aaron Burr, he says, you know, I'm gonna get a scholarship to King's College. I probably shouldn't bag, but dang, I amazed and astonished. The problem is I got a lot of brains, but no polish. I got a holler just to be heard with every word. I drop knowledge. So you can see even within there, there's what we call internal rhyme schemes and also what are called daisy chains, which are hooking rhymes to other rhymes. And so that's a much more sophisticated way of rhyming and for those of us that, that can look back to early hip hop, to me, when I first heard it and I started thinking about it, it reminded me inextricably of Rakim from Pete Rock and C.L. Smooth. Um, excuse me, from, um, um, you know, just Rakim's rhymes. And when I first heard Rakim, he started using rhymes in a way that most people had never seen that was so sophisticated and so nuanced. 
And so it's a really wonderful thing to see that. I was looking in the chat earlier and Eric asked some folks to, to, to also name some of their favorite songs. And, and one of the songs that kept coming up was What Did I Miss, the Jefferson song that, that's so expertly um, delivered by David Diggs. And even that song, so it comes after the intermission and Thomas Jefferson is coming back um, from France and, and singing What Did I Miss. But what's interesting, Thing is you think the way that that song, the design of that song is kind of like harkens back to like an older sound, almost like show tuny. And, and, it, and what, what I think Lynn manuel is doing in this moment is using an antiquated kind of sound and rhyme scheme to show that Jefferson is out of touch with what, what is actually happening and what has actually happened. So you see, you know, um, that Hamilton and Lafayette and Lawrence are all rapping. They're part of this new movement, but Thomas Jefferson is coming over with this kind of antiquated, like, you know, way of, of singing a song, um, which is really interesting. But don't get me wrong, I think David <laughs> Diggs, that's what that is, in, in my opinion as well, one of my favorite songs. But I think that it also, um, does kind of acknowledge the way that, that Lynn Manuel is using the music and using the culture to do some of those things. It's also, I think, beyond hip hop, the, the, the usage of, of pop music too, and the Schuyler sister, I'm back. So um, let me just start talking a little bit about teaching and identity, and then I'll move, I'll move through some more of this. Again, I saw the play as, as, as not just learning about hip hop and culture, but also as, as, as having real deep utility in terms of teaching and, and talking about identity. And you know, in, in my classes, I, I used a lot of Du Bois's work and this idea of double consciousness and having teachers understand the duality that exists for many folks of color, especially black folks in this country and what it means to be both American and black. And what's interesting about this play is that there is obviously themes of, of, of duality and of difference. And I think when I started having my teachers listen to them, because teaching is, 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 is a very difficult, profession for so many reasons but one of the, the difficult things is hard to do is how do teachers begin to develop a teaching identity and what is that identity going to be and how is that identity identity going to be connected to some sort of criticality and so I started using the play Hamilton to to start talking about how can teachers begin to develop a teaching identity one of the most difficult things I've done a lot of research in schools and What's very hard sometimes, especially for, for new teachers, is their interaction um, with veteran teachers and, and in culture and, and the way that the profession is seen is, and I thought that, that it was very akin to, to the interaction between Burr and Hamilton. You know, when, when, when Hamilton uh, first runs into Burr and he says, pardon me, are you Aaron Burr, sir? And that whole interaction and then Burr essentially says, hey, can I buy you a drink? That would be nice. While we're waiting, let me offer you some free advice. Talk less, smile more. So he hits him with that. He's literally giving him advice saying, you don't want to be talking too much. You don't want to be, you know, over, over extending what it is, where your hand is. And I think a lot of teachers get put in those positions as well. We don't do that here. And in one of the most interesting places, and I, I really wish that more people would do research in these spaces, but are in teacher break rooms. And I know that we're on the backdrop of, of a global pandemic, and I want to just, you know, obviously give my deepest respect to teachers and the work that they're doing right now. But historically, I've seen some very interesting interactions in, in these teacher break rooms regarding these types of things, right? Is like, wait for it. I'm going to be patient. I'm, I'm not going to show my hands like this is very burrish in the play, right? That he is inextricably going to just wait. And, and the biggest critique of him is that he doesn't really stand for anything. No one knows who he is. And, you know, he, you know, and if, it, it's just part of, of the play and, and Burr's character. Now, juxtaposed to that, you have, you know, Hamilton, who is the antithesis. He's not going to throw away his shot. He's going to take advantage of every opportunity. He's going to be brash. He's going to disrupt. He's going to do all of those things. And so I was leaning into my teacher candidate saying, hey, what, what kind of identity are you going to have? Are you going to, 
you know, be burrish and standoffish and not say a lot, just observe and just see what happens? Or are you going to be very Hamiltonian and you're going to be disrupting, you're going to be leaning in, you're going to be that really brash person who's not going to, to do this? Um, and so I started asking teachers to think about what kind of identity they wanted, knowing that, that this is not, you know, a monolith, that it's not always applicable, but just thinking about what type of teacher they want to be. Are they going to disrupt? Or are they going to acquiesce to the cultural norms that are going to exist within those schools that they were teaching? So you can see that I was using the play and, and, and having them see these two characters um, and, and, and try and adopt their own identities through some of this work. And, you know, it was interesting conversation. And I think back to these classes and such amazing uh, future teacher candidates and, and the really rich dialogue that we had about identity, which I think is so important as we think about teaching moving forward, especially given the demographics of teaching, that they are overwhelmingly white female, um, and that, you know, how do we be begin to inspire a new generation of, of future teachers that see teaching and as a viable career, but so much of that starts with the current teachers that we have and how do they lean in and how do they make teaching, you know, a, a more accessible type of profession. And I saw this play as a way to help better inform teachers thinking about their own identity and their own positionality with regards to the content that they're teaching and with regards to their own identity. And there's a lot of times the teachers in my experience have been really reticent and, and, and hesitant to really lean in and do really meaningful identity work regarding how they're going to be seen as teaching in front of the class. And I think Hamilton really helped us do some of, some of that work. Um, now, what's really interesting is, is beyond teaching, I think that the play is really useful in terms of thinking of the duality and dissonance within ourselves and within society. Society. Um, as I in, engaged with the play and as I interacted more with it and, and really dug into the lyrics, um, I was essentially digging into my, my own identity and my own sense of self um, with relation to the characters and also in relation to the play. You know, I mentioned this earlier, this talk, talk less, smile more. Don't let them know what, what you're against or what you're for. And there's a lot of folks, and I think it's very interesting in this moment, um, and we think back to even to, to earlier elections of, of you know, how, how long the polls were and how, you know, there's a lot, of, you know, I, I, I truly believe that, that silence is not neutral and that even in the case of the play, Burr's silence what, was not neutral. And I think it's the same way is that when we're thinking about these issues that affect us, especially issues um, along race, and along class, it's really important that, that the silence is, is what allows for these marginalizations to persist. And the play and, and a lot of these, these quotes within the play help us better understand maybe how some folks are interacting with society. That there are a lot of folks who, who may embody a certain type of burr within themselves and, 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 and find a difficulty of being able to kind of articulate where they are at in certain things. However, when, when we don't stand up to these things, when we don't lean in and we don't disrupt when we see inhumanity happening, um, then we lie on the side of the oppressors. And I think that is really interesting regarding this play um, because of that, you know, and, and because of, of, of the themes within there. But what's also interesting is, you know, they tell Burr, if you stand for nothing, what will you fall for? And I mean, to me, this seemed like it was a, a direct homage to Malcolm X, because Malcolm X once said that a man who stands for nothing will fall for anything. And so I, I don't know if Lin-Manuel was reading Malcolm X. I, I would assume it seems like a very close quote, but it, it, it truly is and speaks to um, our necessity to understand what are our, our American values? What do we stand for? And I think we're at a, an interesting time that we're having to examine just exactly what that means. And it's a, very, it's a very difficult place to be because I struggle articulating to my young children just what our values are. I know what we aspire to, but what are they in practice? And again, this play helps us kind of, helps bring this up and helps elevate this in conversation because you could literally hit pause when you're watching the play 
or when you're listening to it and ask a question about this, like, you know, what do you think that we should be standing up for right now in this moment? And if someone says, I don't, you know, I, I honestly, I don't, I don't get involved in politics. I don't, I don't do that. But, you know, there are tremendous political ramifications um, if you do not do anything. And so, again, the play really allows us to be present in this moment, thinking about these themes and about our own actions and, and what it is that we're doing in this moment. I've seen a, a ton of memes lately about, you know, kind of saying like, hey, you know, if you ever asked yourself what you would do um, during the civil rights movement or what you would do, you know, during certain really dark times in history, this is that moment. What are you doing right now? Because history is going to look back on us. Our children, our grandchildren are going to look back and say, what did you do? Like, what, what was really going on that time? And so I, I do think it's important for us to be able to articulate that and be able to, to ask ourselves, what are we standing for right now? And if we don't stand for anything, what are we falling for in this moment? Also, you, you can think then we can also look to Hamilton as well for, for ways of, of coming to the world and seeing the world. And this particular quote where he says, I'm past patiently waiting, I'm passionately smashing every expectation, every act and act of creation. And so it really speaks to his action, right? He's trying to move, he's trying to disrupt, he's trying to, to again, do whatever he has to kind of move what he believes forward. And it, and it really does then speak to action. Like what, like, what are you going to do? Now, what's interesting is if you look at both of these approaches, I'm not saying that either one is, is potentially right or wrong, because I think it depends on context. And sometimes if you channel your inner Hamilton, um, it may not be very strategic, depending on the moment and the context. Um, but also, if, if, if you channel Burr and you don't do anything, that might not be very strategic either. So we can look to the play and the duality of these two characters to help us better understand what it is that we want to do, how we're going to take action, how we're going to lean in, or how sometimes we're going to be very strategic and, and, and play a different type of game of chess, you know, waiting and, and doing those types of things and not really divulging what your strategy is. What I find really, really amazing about this is that Ultimately, and I, I saw a few people, I don't, I don't want to ruin the play, but I'm going to assume that most people in the play, or most people that are here have seen or, or listened to the play, but in the last moments of this, each of them channeled the other to their demise. The whole play, Hamilton is, is reiterating over and over, I'm not going to throw away my shot. I'm not going to throw away my shot. In in that duel with Burr, he throws away his shot. He shoots away. Burr does the, oppo the opposite, you know? He, 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 he takes his shot, right? And to his demise, you know, even in the song, he says, now I'm the villain in your history books. As you can see, well, they channeled each other and it didn't always work out. So I always found that such a beautiful type of way of, of storytelling um, and, and, and kind of turning it on its head within the play. And so, I, I love thinking about this in terms of my own identity and, and how I'm, I'm using both of these, these particular characters to better understand myself and the way that I see the world. Um, what, what, so thinking about that, and I love this, this you know, who tells your story. Um, I think it's really important to, to, to talk about this story itself beyond some of the really you know, amazing artistic aspects of it because the story itself um, you know, begs critique, right? You, you think of, of, of the women that are, that are in the Hamilton play who are amazing in terms of th their performances, but it's also very revisionist in terms of their roles. It's, it's minimizing because they become just consumed by the, the male characters within the play um, as a form of consumption. But I, but I do have to absolutely shout out, you know, Renee Elise Goldberg's performance in Satisfied. I think it, it is one of the most incredible things that I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and so I do want, I just have to say that because that's one of my favorite songs to see her deliver that play in reverse with that level of singing and that level of rhyme scheme is just amazing. But, it, but also when I think of that, I'm like, I'm just so enamored by that. But then I'm like, wow, like really is this, you know, we know historically the marginalization of women um, in the play. And so I think it's, it's a very interesting way to sh showcase women and, and, and their talents. But also, again, you know, when we're thinking of like, who's telling the story, 
there's there's to me there's a disconnect there that 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 leaves a, a bit of a, a a taste in my mouth that I just can't that I can't fully digest. And as I you know become more immersed in this play, I, I've you know started looking at the complexity and the opportunities and and the deficiencies of it. I was having a great conversation with with my mentor and good friend, um, Dr. Manuel Espinosa, and we were talking about Edward Said, who's done some really wonderful work um, in, in terms of um, you know looking at or Orientalism and just like how we fetish you know certain cultures. But anyway, he was talking about Said would which would share you know things that he loved, like books that he loved, but then he would just critique them to no end. And I feel like that with this play, I started off loving it so much, but now as I kind of step back from it and as I, I begin to look at it from many different perspectives, there are certain aspects within the play that I think really necessitate um, critique. And so with that, I think um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about this particular um, play that is also going to run, but you know, Lynn Manuel over and over has talked about that that this play is America then told by America now, and it really I mean in terms of creating diverse roles for folks um, that are that are on Broadway or that do um, musical theater, it, it certainly has you know created opportunities that were that were never there before. Um, but it's also interesting because it because the characters are mostly primarily folks of color, that it creates this, this inverse and kind of inverted sense of, of, of minstrelism that was very interesting. I think that some people find very curious that I love in terms of disruption, but you know, you know, telling this story with folks of color um, to majority white audiences, right? Because accessibility to this play is 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 ridiculous right any anyone who tried to go when it was here in denver knows how expensive it was how really hard it was to get tickets you know once the bots got tickets those prices went way up so so even in terms of accessibility it, it, it is not even though this is a story told by folks of color and what's interesting though is when you leave the play you're you know you're like celebrating the revolution and but essentially you're celebrating a, a sense of of whitewashed history of of a historical type of, of, of understandings of the play that minimize far too much. That, min, that, that for many folks, it becomes, um, it, it's so grossly ahistorical and has so many gaps that some po folks cannot simply entertain it and engage with it. And I have many colleagues who, who have reached out to me. Um, my dear friend Mariana is one of them that I think of who would send me messages and says, I just don't know why you, you really love this place so much. And for me, again, it was the hip hop, the writing and some other things. But I think she was early on, you know, questioning just, you know, the history and the stories and everything else. And, and it's so revisionist, you know, um, and, and this, this wonderful play right here called The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda by Ishmael Reed is is a kind of a pushback or in hip hop, maybe we, we would call it, you know, um, you know, they're getting into a battle about this because he, he wrote this play that was, uh, that's entitled The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda. And they, there was a reading of it at the New York Rican Cafe, uh, Poets Cafe in New York. But essentially in, in the play, um, Lin-Manuel Miranda is, is in the play and he is kind of harassed by a, a group of ghosts. Some of them are, are slave, slaves that were owned by um, the Schuylers. Some of them were um, Native Americans that were erased from the story. Uh, I think Harriet Tubman was one of them and an indentured white servant. And they all come to Lin-Manuel as he's writing the play, asking him questions about how he's leaving certain things out. And in this reading, Lin-Manuel struggles, you know, being able to answer and to fact check any of the play. And essentially, you know, in the play, they're, 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 they're critiquing essentially what a lot of folks are saying is that this play is lacking and that it, it, in terms of a historical context, that it, it leaves so much out that how could you do that? How could you literally not put some of these things in there? And, and you know, and, and there are some lines within the play that, you know, that do acknowledge 
you know, that there were some folks like John Lawrence, you know, who wants to lead the first black battalion. It mentions the New York Manumission Society, which, which is a, a really weird thing. They're talking about ending slavery, but most of the people that were in the Manumission Society, including John Jay, Hamilton, Burr, owned enslaved people. Um, and so, so a lot of folks, it's, 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 it, it is, really lacking in. And for those of us that teach and that we know that we're pushing against Eurocentric forms of history, um, this is doing that work as well. And, it, and I mentioned earlier, you get so seduced into it that, you, that it's sometimes hard to step back and be like, wait a second, how do you just completely gloss over that? Um, and, and you end up falling in love with some of these characters that, that are really, um, quite frankly, historically terrible folks that have done in incredibly terrible things. And so this, I, I encourage you to look up Ishmael Reed's play. There's, there's a transcript as well where you can read through it. And I think it's, it's important. And I think even recently, you know, as the play was being released on, on Disney Plus, there was a lot of questions in this moment to Lin-Manuel around critique, around, you know, it's, it's glossing over of enslavement and indigenous folks. And, you know, he, he, he was, it was very political, but did say like, hey, I, I welcome all critiques. But there hasn't been a lot of response to some of those things because it's, it's, it's really, you know, it's unfortunate. I mean, what's also very, I think, heinous is, is, is the erasing of indigeneity um, in the narrative. I mean, uh, you know, they do talk about manumission. They do talk about, you know, trying to, to abolish and, and have the first Black Battalion. But for, for Indigenous folks, there is essentially no mention at all within the play. And, and I know that for many folks that this is, this is, this is um, inexcusable. And you think of the Lenape people that have been in that region for you know, a, a, over 10,000 years um, and that were you know, slaughtered, murdered, and you know, our, our country's two original sins, you know, our, our enslavement and, and manifest destiny and, and the, the erasure and, and the, just the, gro the gross heinousness of colonialism and you know to be in this place celebrating it because it's using hip hop and to be celebrating colonialism um, creates you know a real discomfort for me now that I look back on the play that makes me that 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 I struggle with because as much as I love the delivery and everything about the play um, it still creates something very very um, uneven in me it creates disequilibrium that I struggle reconciling and you know. As I was preparing for this talk and you know knowing that hey we're going to talk about the utility but let's also talk about um the complexity um i i was reading i i looked again <laughs> i looked back to 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 my readings and i was reading fanon um france fanon's work and i was reading wretched of the earth and there's a particular quote in there that really struck me and he says in the colonial context the settler only ends his work of breaking in, in the native when the latter admits loudly and intelligibly the supremacy of the white man's values. Loudly and intelligibly is what I've been saying about this play for so long. And it is inextricably tied to the supremacy of white values. Even Hamilton as a character himself, um, if you think of, of, you know, treasury or state, he takes the treasury, we're still, experiencing that economic system that has for many that for people of color has been oppressive marginalizing inaccessible and and you know you think of the class um distinctions that exist in this country as a result of hamilton's system uh it's really hard to kind of think back and be like yeah i'm celebrating this you know i'm singing all of these songs and you know so it, it's an interesting part of this play that makes us think about what what types of things are we actually celebrating and recognizing and acknowledging in terms of values? And what's really interesting is one of my favorite characters in the play is King George III, um, who is a tyrant. And, and you know, um, but Goff does such a wonderful job of playing him that I find myself like loving every bit of that aspect of the play. But then you think about, then also I step back and was like, wow, you know, thinking of, of authoritarianism and things that we're experiencing and we're seeing, it's like, what am I celebrating here? How can I do this? And what type of values am I espousing by, by looking, you know, 
or kind of overlooking certain things within this play. And it just becomes um, very difficult for me to do some of those things. And so ultimately, you know, for many of us who, who love this play, there is a deep sense of cognitive dissonance that exists, right? That I, that I love the play as, as a piece of art um, in terms of its delivery, of its, of its, you know, incredible respect to hip hop. And, and, and quite frankly, this play can only be told through hip hop because if anyone who's read Chernow's book, it's a tome, I mean, it's huge. And so it, and you think of the play itself, is because they use rhyming, they can compress more words into this play. Most musicals, if you sang every lyric in Hamilton, it, the play would probably be seven hours long. But I do love that part of it, but also the, what is, is missing from it, the, the analysis and, and the whitewashing of history to me is, is very difficult to reconcile and I continue to struggle with that. But as the quote says here, you know, only you will be in the room when it happens with regards to this play. And you'll have to figure out, you know, if the, the things that are left out and that are glossed over are too, um, too gross to ignore, you know, then this play may not be of much utility to you. However, if, you know, you can reconcile that and see it for what it is, you know, like many of us, you can see that there's great value in this and some utility in terms of having very difficult conversations. And so um, it, it's, it's such an interesting phenomenon. It's such an interesting juxtaposition. And there's so many nuances to this play that, that even as I'm leaning into it now, I continue to kind of peel back that onion and see such amazing things for myself um, within the characters, within the rhyming, and within the kind of cultural context of the play. Um, one thing I want to say before we get, well, I saw some questions in, in, in the chat is that, you know, um, history has, has its eyes on you, it has its eyes on me, it has its eyes on us. And if I could ask you to not throw away your shot in terms of being a, a decent, kind, generous person in these dark moments, don't throw that away. Don't throw your shot away at doing that because to me, that is one of the greatest lessons that we can do. You know, um, what would you do with more time? We have this time now, it's not guaranteed to us. And so don't throw away your shot. To, to, to develop your own humanity and to develop the humanity in others. So I'm, I'm, I'm I would love to take some questions um, in the chat. I saw some scrolling in. Um, I don't know if Eric, if you wanna just ask them cause I, I, I can't really see all of them, but if you wanna ask a few, I'm happy to kind of share and, and, and answer as best I can. Yeah, so one of the questions that came up is around whether, whether this can be replicated, whether, you know, there's another historic figure whose story can be told in the same way using hip hop or other contemporary, you know, art forms uh, to engage conversation. Uh, and, and if so, I think part of the question was, who would that be in your opinion? Um, you know, so I, absolutely, I think something like this could be replicated to this type of cultural phenomenon. I don't know, that might be hard to replicate, but I would, you know, I would love to see hip hop and storytelling and testimonio and you know afro futurism and latino futurism to be told to, to tell these stories but using hip hop as the medium um I, I would love to see something like this around gloria and saldua's work you know not enough queer scholars get elevated i love james baldwin you know and he's you know there's some traction with james baldwin recently but i would love to see you know some some things like that brought to life using hip hop as 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 a medium to do it, um, but I also think that there's ways for us to learn about maybe not indigenous ways of knowing um, that can be used through through hip hop and through storytelling. And so there's there's great work that's out there, but it's not necessarily delivered in this way. But I mean, hopefully, young kids that this can be a springboard for young folks to be creative and to think about how do we tell stories. It, um, and elevate voices that have been silenced through curriculum and through schooling um, in, in using this as an exemplar of a way to do it. So I'm hopeful that this will happen, that we can, you know, do this. But, you know, in terms of who, I mean, I can list probably 10 folks that I would love to, <laughs> to have a musical or some sort of, um, you know, play using hip hop about. So you mentioned that you heard the music first before seeing the play. Um, how did that experience change? 
Wow, you know, so I, I listened to the, the soundtrack hundreds of times and um, had no real optical way of seeing it until I got to see it in Chicago when m my partner and my wife took me there for my 40th birthday. And I remember reading something that, that Michelle Obama said it was, it was the greatest piece of art that she's ever seen. And I, had, and I felt that way when, when you see it because when it's animated in addition to how, how dope the lyrics are and, and, and the writing is, it, 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 it was overwhelming my senses. And so I think a lot of folks who actually have gotten to see it now on Disney probably feel the same way that you're like, whoa, like this, the, the, the pageantry of it, everything that, 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 you, that you see is just an additional layer that's on to something that is really fantastic to begin with. And so quite frankly, when I saw it for the first time, I, I was utterly overwhelmed and, and missed, I actually missed a lot. So I was talking to my wife when we watched it again and she, she was like, you know what, I don't even remember some of these things because when you're at the play, you know, we were, we were kind of looking around at everything, looking at, at you know, um, the orchestra as well. So it, it was something to experience when I got to see it in person. So Roberta, I've got a fascinating question for you. So Jessica's asking, based on what you shared, um, what do you think the net impact of the piece is? Is it negative or positive <clears throat> given both sides? And then if you had the ability to wipe it from existence as if it never had been written or produced, would you? Oh my gosh, these are fantastic questions. Um, and I don't think that we can fully say just yet what the net impact is going to be. I think um, it's still yet to be determined. Um, I think that, that for me, um, when, it, when high schools start doing the play, in, in a much larger fashion when we get back to doing those things, you know, I think the net impact can be, can, can be mitigated. Cause I think it's going to end up being negative because I think that they're in this moment as, as we're elevating black voices, as we're elevating indigenous voices, like we need to do that. This play doesn't do that. So it doesn't align with our values right now. And so ultimately in my mind, I think that it is, that there's some immense value in terms of, of, of its uniqueness. But I think ultimately as we are, this is not you know, a moment, this is the movement to quote the play itself. Our movement is going beyond what this play was not able to do and does not do in terms of elevating the voices of, of the marginalized. And so I think the net impact is going to be, I would say neutral that if these, you know, hopefully if, if this play is done at a high school, that there can be a curriculum assigned to not only enjoy the play to talk about history, but to talk about what is missing from it. So that's where I think we can maybe neutralize the, the negative impact of it. If I could erase it from, no, I would not erase it from, from existence because it, it is problematic. I, some of my favorite um, music in the world are from jazz musicians that are incredibly problematic and I, I would not, erase their music from, from existence. And one of, you know, I love that question, but there is also a dark side um, to the subjunctive that if you get in that place of, you know, what could we, it's a dark place to be. It, Hamilton is here, it kind of, it, it, it is in reality, but how do we do, mitigate some of the, the, the gross um, deficiencies that have from the play? So going back to your um, discussion around uh, you know, sharing this with educators. Danielle asked, what lessons can white educators, and I would say any educators, take from Hamilton in relation to the importance of representation in often whitewashed uh, American history? Yeah, I mean, this is why I used it in, in my classes with primarily white pre-service educators, because I thought that there was something very important in terms of hearing um, people of color tell history, even if it, it is problematic. I think that, you know, the importance of the counter narrative is really important. And I think in, in some way that this is a bit of a counter narrative, like Lin-Manuel writing it in this way, casting it in this way, does tell a, a narrative that is a bit different, even if the story itself doesn't. And so that I think that white educators can learn of what the, the genius that lies within students of color, like Lin-Manuel, like these, these particular uh, folks who were cast in the play, that how do we nurture curiosity? 
how do we nurture this type of artistic expression within our young children, especially children of color, without forcing compliance within the, the, the four walls of classrooms. So to me, that is one of the most beautiful things that I think that, that white educators and all educators can take from them. Find ways to, say, to, to nurture and to cultivate and to support curiosity that is beyond the measurements that we have within our current school system, that is beyond the, 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 the problematic curriculums that we teach. Supplement those curriculums, not only with this type of stuff, with hip hop, with, with um, indigenous voices, with authors of color, but just look to these students as, as geniuses, the geniuses that they are and the geniuses that they descend from. So Chris uh, gives a statement. First, by the way, you've got a lot of uh, people really uh, you know, uh, complimenting your work and uh, you know, complimenting the time that you spent. So thank you for that. Um, Chris gives a statement, but I'd like to get your thoughts on it. It's not quite a question. He says about Hamilton, I love how it also, in addition to exposing people uh, to history, uh, also educates uh, some about hip hop, uh, you know, and, and it uh, shines a bright on, you know, the beauty of hip hop. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of the, I think, the very the utility of this play is that, that you are getting multiple things at once. Once. And to me, as an educator, that's a wonderful lesson plan that you are getting exposed to so many different things at the same time, learning about hip hop, but also learn about the history of hip hop, that hip hop is born out of oppression, that we took music out of school, that DJs took two albums to make turntables to extend breaks, that it's out of graffiti that it's out of emceeing like this this whole genre this cultural phenomenon this global phenomenon that is hip-hop is born out of oppression so tell that story too when you're talking about this play it allows you to also engage in the systematic oppression that has existed from our own government the story itself is is interesting because it's talking about you know, people that are moving away from government and, and oppression but then yet create a system that does exactly the same thing. And hip hop is a counter narrative to that oppression. So it's a wonderful way to do that, to engage in history, to engage in hip hop, but also to do it in a way that is not a historical and that does not gloss over the, the very intentional actions that are taken to further marginalize communities that have been underserved, under um, funded forever. <laughs> and so I, I think it's, it's a great way to do that. Okay, I think we're running out of time, but let me ask a question that I think a few people have touched on here. You know, you, you mentioned it being a challenging time currently. Obviously, we're all, you know, in the midst of a global pandemic. Uh, we've got uprisings happening across the country related to injustice and, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter. Uh, you know, we've got a, a, a presidential election, which is contentious to say the least. Uh, what can we learn from Hamilton, what can we pull from the Hamilton experience that may help us inform how to understand what's happening today and how to navigate, uh, you know, our, these times, if you will. So I think we can look to the play um, to give us an example. If you look at the end of the play, especially of, you know, and it talks about time and it talks, you know, Lynn manuel talks about our Hamilton character talks about like, I imagine death so much, it feels like a memory. So it's a very macabre kind of theme within it. Um, and in my mind, at the end, you know, where they're talking about what would you do with more time? What, like, how do we use this play to see the lessons of, of how we can look to the best of ourselves? How can we, we look to kind of bring out the, those those these innate things within ourselves that that connect us um, and hip hop connects. I think history connects us, and so to me, the play is doing some of that work of bringing us together. But we have to come to it with a deep sense of humility. We have to use our ears proportional to our mouth, and we have to be willing to understand that we do not have truth with a capital T. We may be on a, on a journey and be trying to find truth. But it's when we act like we know that, that we get into a problem. So can we all look to understand and just reconcile that we have truth with the lowercase t, we're all on a journey and how can we learn from one another? And this play allows us to do that. So use the play to, 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 to lean into tough conversations, 
to, to bring, to, to look to the best of some of these characters and to look the best within ourselves. To me, that's one, some of the best utility of the play. Um, so find, use it as a way, especially others that don't think exactly like you. And so, um, so deeply humbled and honored to be here to talk to you about this. I really deeply apologize that I got kicked out in the middle, um, but I'm glad that we were able to finish strong and, and this has truly been a pleasure. So thank you so much. So Roberta, thank you. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, you know, we would love to have you back at our museums once we can no. see you in person and we can do this again, uh, whether it's about Hamilton or, or many of the other things that you bring uh, to the table. So thank you for your time this evening. Um, I'd just like to take a few minutes to share uh, what's coming up with History Colorado. So if you can bear with me as we, as we share uh, what's next. Um, before we do that, I do want to thank the Sangre de Cristo National Heritage Area, Colorado State University, Pueblo, and all of our donors uh, for supporting public programming at History Colorado uh, and History Colorado Community Museums in particular. Um, as we mentioned, you can contribute to our Borderlands project at coloradogives.org. Um, upcoming events, we've got some great things. I think that um, y'all will be uh, excited to see. September 24th is the next lecture in our Borderlands series. We've got Dr. Majal Boxer, who's a professor of Indigenous Studies at Fort Lewis College, who will talk about the history of Fort Lewis Indian School in Durango. Um, if you are uh, a Hamilton fan, like I assume many of you are, October 1st, as part, of our, as part of our This Is What Democracy Looks Like speaker series, also through History Colorado, we've got Dr. Richard Bell, who's gonna talk about Hamilton, the founders, and democracy. Until then, thank you for joining us. Have a great evening. And Roberta, thank you again.